This is Andy Gutierrez from StarWars.com, and you are listening to Coffee with Kenobi with Dan Z. This is the podcast you're looking for. This is James Arnold Taylor, and you're listening to Coffee with Kenobi. Hmm, I have a good feeling about this. Hello, my friends, and welcome to Coffee with Kenobi, show number 408. This is your spoiler-free place for Star Wars discussion, analysis, and rhetoric. I'm your host, Dan Z, drinking One Nation coffee out of my Star Wars Rival Run Weekend coffee mug from 2019 in honor of everyone doing their thing this weekend and running in the Star Wars virtual races all around the world. It's very, very exciting. I'm so proud and impressed of all of your hard work. It's going to pay off with that amazing medal you're going to get from Run Disney. Congratulations in advance to each and every one of you. Whether it's the movies, Disney+, Plus, animation, Star Wars books, comic books, or collectibles, this is a family-friendly place to talk about all the things we love about that galaxy far, far away. On today's show, the awesome Kristen Baver joins us to talk about Skywalker, A Family at War, and what it was like to tell the Skywalker saga through a biographical lens in this amazing new book. So pull up a chair, grab your favorite coffee mug, and let's have some coffee with Kenobi. So who talks first? You talk first? I talk first? Joining us today for a cup of coffee is the author of Skywalker, A Family at War, Kristen Baver. Kristen, welcome back to Coffee with Kenobi. Thank you so much for having me, Dan, and uh, I'm so pleased to be back. Uh, I don't know if your listeners remember or if they know this story, but Coffee with Kenobi is the first and possibly at this time the only podcast I've ever appeared on. Wow. And that now I'm so back. Cool. I love it. I love, well, you left such an impression. We we kept the microphone ready for you. We dusted all the time because we knew someday our paths would cross again. And I'm so happy we did because you are the author of this fantastic new book. And I've got so many questions to ask you. I know a lot of our listeners want to hear these answers as well. So we'll just start right with it. With your impressive resume and history with Lucasfilm, you've certainly experienced a lot of amazing things in Star Wars. How does discovering you're going to write a Star Wars book compare? And please let us know what it was like when you were first contacted about this. Uh, first of all, just thank you <laughs> for such kind words. Um, I never think of myself as having an impressive resume. Uh, so it's a little startling to hear that, but I, I so appreciate that. And, and I do recognize that I've had you know quite a, a journey and a lot of really amazing opportunities, uh, both to get me to, to where I am today, but also just since I have been with Lucasfilm almost for three years now, yeah. which is, is a crazy short amount of time and also feels like I've been there forever. <laughs> um, so I distinctly remember when I first was talking to the editor of this book uh, at DK, uh, Alistair Dougal, um, he emailed me and we were, it, our first conversations were over email and I actually, you know, looked back uh, at this just a little while ago to refresh my memory. Cause it's been, uh, you know, about a year all told for this whole journey to come full circle. And when we, he first emailed me about it, I know my first instinct was to answer him in all caps because <laughs> I was just like screaming and I was so excited. And then I thought, no, no, be cool. Be cool. Be cool. Okay. So I managed to get it down to just like one word was in all caps, but I, I could not control the impulse enough to just have like a completely normal professional email go back because um, I was just beside myself with excitement. Um, I think the exact words I used were this project sounds truly amazing because it it's just such a, an amazing idea to work on. Um, you know, it, it feels at once like, oh, Yes, obviously we should do a biography of the Skywalkers, but also like something that we have not done in the past. And it really spoke to my particular skills in a in a way that I didn't fully realize, I think, or appreciate until we were already in the process of writing it. Um, because I come from a hard news journalism background, currently working in editorial at StarWars.com on the news and blog side. Um, so on the face of it, I don't think uh, a biographer uh, is necessarily, you know, the the next um, job opportunity I would expect for myself. But when you really get down to what a biographer is doing and the kind of work and research that goes into it, it actually makes total sense. 
Um, and so I was really able to, to use a lot of the skills that I learned in the newsroom to bring, you know, that kind of um, critical, but also I think just kind of scholarly and um, you know, unbiased, I hope, I, <laughs> to the Skywalker family and tell this story in a way that, you know, hopefully offers some fresh insights, but is also a kind of a fresh perspective on everything that we already know about the family. I love it. Yeah. The, no, the lens through which you've filtered this is, is, ex, is excellent. I mean, obviously, you know, you and I have been friends for years and years and, and I certainly consider myself something of a book snob and I, I'm okay. I said, I'm an English teacher during my day job. So you should I, be. I, I'm a professional. Learning. Yeah. <laughs> but I, so I, from the, the first paragraph, I thought this is gripping. Like I legitimately have goosebumps when I remember I was sitting on the front porch. My wife was sitting next to me. She was reading something. I'm reading and I went, wow. She says, what? I said, Kristen's book is awesome. I've only read the first paragraph. A true story, an oh, absolute yeah. true story, because this is tricky, right? I mean, we're talking about, you know, turf that we've explored over and over again. But so I want to kind of look at sort of when it was first pitched to you as far as how you're going to approach this. What was your strategy like for beginning the writing process? Because you've included the movies and, of course, a lot of canonical material. There's a, there's a lot to kind of disseminate for this. Can you hear my cat now? Uh, the, the cat agrees. <laughs> the cat agrees. He's been here the whole time, helping me every step of the way. Uh, the ghostwriter. He is credited in the, the bio, at least, because he's <laughs> a you know, big part. Um, yeah, so to go back to, to something you said, and, and it is so kind. You know, I, I just, I'm... I'm really thrilled and, you know, somewhat overwhelmed and at a loss for words for, for all of the, the kindness that has come from, um, you know, all of the fans and readers so far. And it's really been you know, wonderful to be on the receiving end of that. Uh, you know, but what you just said about the first sentence being really important uh, goes back again to something that I learned through journalism, which is, you know, that you have to hook the reader at the very beginning. You cannot assume that anyone is going to read anything that you have to say just, you know, because they don't have to. They've got other things going on. They've got a cell phone in hand, probably. They've got other distractions. They've got their own lives to live. So you really have to give them something that is worth their time and is really going to keep them, um, you know, kind of ensnared <laughs> in your story. Um, and that goes right back to, you know, things I learned in the newsroom, because especially with newspapers, they're so disposable and digestible. Mm -hmm. If you don't get people interested in what you have to say, you're going to lose them right away to the next story or the next page. They're just going to move on. Um, so to, back to your question though, about, you know, kind of how this, how this book kind of came into being, um, you know, I think the first germ of the idea was to do a biography of the Skywalker family, recognizing that in terms of in galaxy, they are, you know, an Im important dynasty. Um, I initially, as I was doing my own research, um, to even just get ready to write this book, I had looked at some uh, families in our world that I felt, you know, kind of had that same legendary status. Uh, you know, nobody is the Skywalkers in our world, <laughs> first of all. Um, there's no Anakin Skywalker that I could find to study. But I did look at, uh, you know, some, some uh, biographies of John F. Kennedy, I did look at uh, the, the House of Windsor and the royals over in uh, England and just kind of tried to piece together how do people see these larger than life types of icons? Um, how do they digest that? How do they write a biography to kind of humanize them and tell you stories that you don't already know? Because, you know, for a lot of those figures, it, those public figures, their best moments and their worst moments are already um you know, part of the news cycle. So, you know, we have very intimate knowledge of their lives already coming into it. So that was a really great kind of crash course in if I want to make the Skywalkers feel like they are real people because they feel like real people to you and I, you know, the, the fans have spent over 40 years with this family. They feel like, you know, somebody at that level in our world. So we wanted to pay respect to that. And we wanted to do something that, um, you know, really highlighted that legendary status, at, but at the same time, uh, really brought them down to earth and explored 
you know, all of their human frailties, their relationships, the way that they conflicted with themselves, with themselves and each other, um, and also how all of the things that they do really impact not only their family and have such a ripple effect, but almost everybody in the galaxy, <laughs> because the Skywalkers really just have their fingers in everything. That's true. And honestly, hearing you explain that reminded me a couple of years ago, I, I was reading a lot of work from David McCullough, who's this incredible historian, but he he writes about characters that are almost fictional in our minds and makes them come to life. So what you kind of did a very similar approach. You, you, you took something, you made it historical and fictional at the same time. I don't know if I'm explaining that very well, but that's kind of how it breathed to me because I feel like specifically what we've got here is a structure as, of a biography, which brings a unique set of challenges. So your writing process as far as getting these chapters down, because some of the chapters are smaller than others, but they're nice and bite-sized, but you pack a lot in, in these individual chapters. What kind of challenges did you run into while preparing these stories? Mm -hmm. uh, so I think one of the first challenges was probably knowing that we wanted to kind of weave together the story of the Skywalkers looking at all of the existing lore. You know, we wanted to look at books. We wanted to look at comics. We wanted to look at the films, of course. We wanted to look at the animated series. And so when you take all of that together, at first I thought, oh, okay, no, th I can wrap my head around this. This is great. And then I started making the actual reading list and <laughs> I started realizing just how much uh, we have put out um, in the last couple of years alone that touches upon this family and that I would really need to, you know, ensure that I was taking a look at and either, you know, giving it a nod in a sentence, breaking it down in a whole chapter or two, um, you know, or sometimes even it was the, the kind of material that I would read through it and think, okay, I think we can explore this more in a broader sense of here are some really great character traits that the story explores, but I don't think it rises to the level of importance that we need to spell out every single move that Anakin makes in this story. And those were kind of uh, something that I, I it, at least to myself, I thought of them as like the, what they ate for breakfast stories, um, <laughs> which is not to say that they are not important <laughs> in the lore, but when you're looking at it from a biographical standpoint, there are some events that are absolutely essential to cover and to discuss. And I think a lot of the, you know, the big beats in the films definitely are, are, are some of those moments. And then there are kind of the, the smaller, quieter moments. And sometimes those are fun to explore, but sometimes, you know, in, in the scope of someone's entire life, when you're looking at it in a, in book form, you know, you do have to kind of lose some of those details. I, I feel like it must've been extremely challenging to have to kind of slice and dice because I like that you go through a, the, the most important thing I think that has made the Skywalker family so powerful to all of us is, is that they're at the end of the day, they're human. They have these extraordinary abilities and, and circumstances that happen, but you bring out the humanity in them. And, and that is especially clear when you're looking at these three different trilogies for Skywalker family legacy. Let's look at them individually for the prequel trilogy. What do you feel was the most important to emphasize as far as Anakin's slow fall from grace and what obstacles were present that you were able to avoid? Mm -hmm. um, with Anakin, I think we knew at the outset that, you know, Anakin is the father of the, the Skywalker dynasty, uh, you know, and that is not to say that Shmi Skywalker, his mother is not incredibly important, but in terms of the existing lore, there is not a lot that we've explored about Shmi. There's not a lot to pull from. And then with Anakin, it is an embarrassment of riches. You know, he has, he dominates the prequel trilogy. He is a, a really key and essential part of the Clone Wars series. And so looking at all of that, um, you know, we knew that that would have to, you know, really make up a large part of this book, but also really anchor the story. So I feel like part one of the book is kind of a lonely journey alongside Anakin um, every time I read it or got, even when I got done writing it, um, the first time I felt kind of sad mm -hmm. and, you know, initially I thought, Oh no, I, I think I've done it wrong <laughs> because I, I feel so bad. But when you look at Anakin's journey, um, you know, 
I don't, oh, here comes my cat again. He's very excited about Anakin's journey. Um, <laughs> I, I don't think you, you should come out of that feeling great because it's, it's a very sad story of a, a kid with tremendous potential and gifts. And, you know, he gets manipulated and corrupted and, uh, you know, eventually makes so many rationalizations for his behavior and sacrifices that, you know, he ends up becoming a Sith Lord. Um, Mm. And of course, you know, anybody who's seen the prequel trilogy knows that journey. So one of our challenges for this book, I think, was, you know, in the humanizing of it, uh, you really follow Anakin step by step and see exactly how those events coalesced and came into play in this chronological order, which to me was really fascinating because it was something that I had not previously really sat down to think about in this kind of detail. Um, But for example, one of the parts I love is, uh, you know, young Anakin and Shmi and that whole opening chapter where you just see how great his childhood really was, you know, even though it wasn't perfect and, um, you know, they're in this terrible situation on this terrible planet with Watto, who's not a great guy, but Shmi has so much love and there's so much compassion in that house and they're so giving and there's just so many great moments, um, just in, in that domesticity that we see in, you know, just for a, a fraction of the Phantom Menace. Um, but one of the things I think I really loved that came out of this chapter, or not this chapter, this part, rather, many chapters, uh, one of the things I really love was getting to break down that step by step of, okay, but how does he get from being this, you know, adorable little kid who's just, you know, welcoming strangers off the street to, to share dinner because there's going to be a sandstorm and he's looking out for them, even though he doesn't really know them. So in terms of uh, you know, things that I'm very proud of with this, um, I had never really thought about how when Shmi dies, he, she's barely uh, buried and gone before he's running off to go save Obi-Wan. And then they're you know, barely out of that situation um, or really it is that situation that gives birth to the Clone Wars. Mm -hmm. And then he's at war for three years and, you know, then everything just goes off the rails. And I had never really sat down to think about how he doesn't have any time to grieve that he doesn't really have any time to process that and how much of an impact that makes on all of his decisions that come after it. Um, Because he just has zero time to be happy with Padme. He has zero time to think about his loss with his mother and putting that all in perspective in this book really gave me a different insight on that than I had had previously. Here, here. I think one of the takeaways, and I'm glad you mentioned Shmi, because one of the things that I, I'd never thought about um, her journey was how great of a mom she is because, and you just said this beautifully, because she makes him feel like he's got a great life. Even though we know he doesn't, deep down inside he knows he doesn't, but he's happy. He's at peace because of his mom, you know, and coming from a, a single mom myself and, uh, and just how much I admire my wife. I just, I thought you captured the essence of what it means to be a mom so beautifully. I mean, seriously, that was one of the top, my favorite parts of this first opening sequence. Thank you. Thank you. And I will say um, there were parts of this book that I certainly drew on, you know, my own experiences in some ways. Um we, I certainly wasn't, you know, fabricating my own experience into the, the Skywalker story, but just in terms of, you know, looking at my own life to think, you know, what makes a great mom? I have a great mom. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I have a lot of great maternal figures in my life. You know, what do they do? What are kind of these universal things that make for a great parent? And how can we, you know, look at that in, in terms of the, the Skywalker family, because you know that Shmi's a great mom. Um, you don't see all of the, the things that we necessarily explore in the book, but we were extrapolating a lot from the dialogue and from other pieces of lore that already exist. And that was a really fun journey to think, you know, of course, the, 
the pilots that are coming through Mos Espa are telling young Anakin stories, but I'm sure Shmi is also telling him stories because she's a mom, you know, parents always tell their kids stories. So just, you know, getting to that level of, you know, kind of granular humanity with them was really fun. Let's go ahead and take a quick break and we'll be back with so much more from Kristen Baver. This is Coffee with Kenobi. This is Vanessa Marshall, and you're listening to Coffee with Kenobi. Once you are ready to plan that vacation, whether it's to Walt Disney World, Disneyland, or anywhere you want to go on the planet, be sure to check out MEI and Mouse Fan Travel, the official travel partner of Coffee with Kenobi. Their signature service and expert advice will help clients maximize their vacation time and dollar. I use them for my personal travel when it's safe to do so. I use them for coffee with Kenobi. And as we get closer and closer to hopefully another celebration in 2022, you can be sure that I will be talking to Becky Mankin and the team at MEI and Mouse Fan Travel. There are certainly a number of excellent reasons to use MEI and Mouse Fan Travel. For one thing, their service is completely free to you. They are there to help you, to guide you, to help you with tips on getting into the parks, where should I go as far as what day I'm going to be there, what rides are the smartest ones to check out first, what are some of the best dining opportunities, whether you're traveling alone, whether you're traveling with that someone special, whether you're traveling with your family or just with a bunch of your friends, they will take care of you. They are an amazing, amazing service. I cannot recommend them enough. Again, I use them for both my personal travel as well as for everything we do at Coffee with Kenobi. And I will certainly be using them for future trips to Galaxy's Edge, the Star Wars Galactic Star Cruiser one day, and so many more exciting opportunities. So whether you're going to go to Disney World, whether you're going to go to somewhere else on the planet, and hopefully someday Disneyland when that opens, MEI and Mouse Fan Travel, the Coffee with Kenobi travel partner, is your one-stop shop. If you have any questions, be sure to ask me or go to our travel affiliate link, which can be found on our webpage, in the show notes, or all over social media. Thank you so much. You will have the best time. And please let us know about your great experiences with MEI and Mouse Fan Travel. Right, and being able to walk in their psyche, which you allow, which you bring us forth. And by the way, just off the record, thank you for not putting these little ominous winks of, but who knows what will happen to Anakin. Thank you for not Peter Jacksoning this whole thing. Oh, right. yeah. Oh, good. That's, that was yeah. great. All thank right. So, you. thank you. Although, and I will say, um, you were tempted. I, I wasn't, I was a little tempted. I was, I was, but, yeah, that's um, fair. Yeah. fortunately, you know, my editor was like, don't, I, I think maybe the first chapter I gave a flag of, you know, one of those winky things. And like, don't do that. Don't do that. You know, so great editors at play here. Um, but also there were times where it felt necessary to give some kind of context flag. I would mm. say like, you know, the very first line in the first chapter is, you know, Anakin's going to become Darth Vader. If you've watched none of the star Wars movies, I just spoiled a really big plot point for you. Thanks later. a lot. Yeah. Right. Sorry. Um, so there were some like contextual things that, you know, I thought were important or, you know, Darth Sidious, we have to know that Darth Sidious is Palpatine sure. much earlier than Anakin or anyone else realizes it to understand the context and the weight of what he's doing. I want to talk to you about, we mentioned, of course, parenting and Star Wars and parenting is a pretty important dynamic, but the challenge with Luke and Leia's story is that it's been told the most of any of the Skywalkers due to when the original film was released. How did you approach the narrative style here what did the experience teach you about the twins that you had not perhaps previously considered? So another interesting um, challenge that I found when we approached the writing of that section was that, you know, Anakin is on a solitary journey for all of part one. There are a lot of important figures that come in and out of his life that we talk about and, you know, how they nurture him and how they impact him. And, you know, Padme Amidala, probably chief among them and her role in his life and, you know, their relationship. But then when I got to Luke and Leia, I thought, oh no, I have to treat them equally. My cat just went through his crinkle shoot. He has not used that in three years, but he takes this opportunity to crinkle uh, <laughs> loudly. I don't know if you can hear it. I can, um, it's fine. It was just part of okay. it. I thought it was a sandstorm. It was a sandstorm. Yeah. Yes. Somebody let me into their house, please. Um, 
So with Luke and Leia, I think one of the really big challenges was all of a sudden you went from the solitary journey with Anakin to having two equally important characters who you needed to balance. So our, you know, my impulse was to make sure that we kind of went every other chapter with them, you know, flitting between young Leia. And we know we've got a lot of good information about young Leia, thanks to Claudia Gray and her uh, Leia Princess of Alderaan book. So we pulled from that, you know, to, to tell more of the story of Leia and the Organas and, you know, their adoption and everything that's going on in her life when she's, you know, a young girl in so much as, you know, we know it because that story really begins, I think, when she's 14, 12 or 14. And, you know, Luke, we don't have a ton of information about what young Luke was up to, but we have enough that we can really draw some, um, you know, kind of a, a rough sketch of, of what that life was like up until the moment when we meet him and he just wants to go to Tashi station to get some power converters. <laughs> so, you know, just being able to flip between the two of them until the moment that they actually meet on the Death Star and then allow the story to kind of propel forward with both of them, uh, I think worked really well in terms of keeping them balanced and, you know, keeping things moving along. But then, of course, you know, it was an extra challenge when Vader shows up. And I was like, well, now there's three Skywalkers. So now we got to focus on all of them. Um, so that was a really kind of fun juggling act of making sure that you're keeping all of the, the threads together, but also not letting yourself kind of get lost in, you know, a, a retelling of the story that we know so well. Mm -hmm. um, but I really think all of those extra pieces that have come about in the last 40 years really make that section to me feel like it's not just, you know, if you've watched a new hope countless times, there's still something in here that will provide a fresh insight because we do talk about everything that happened before a new hope. And we even get a little bit more, I think of a, or at least I got more of an appreciation for the timing with a new hope in terms of Leia losing her entire planet and her family and Luke losing his aunt and uncle um, you know, the timing on that is just so close together. And so to have the twins both experiencing this tremendous loss at the same time was, again, one of those points that I've seen the movie more times than I can count, but I had never really thought about it in in those words, I guess. I had never really thought about it in that context. Well, it's very cool, isn't it, when you're writing or you're explaining something to someone, you do look at it, even something you're so familiar with, and you use the word fresh, and that's exactly what I was going to say. You make, you make it feel fresh, which is which is tricky to do because, again, we're so familiar with them. But you, you mentioned Vader. So your work on Anakin and Vader is honestly some of my favorite in the entire book as far as characterization goes. Talk about your writing on the legendary villain and how much his experience as a Jedi affects how you looked at the psyche of Darth Vader. Mm, mm hmm Vader was interesting because there is a lot of lore about Darth Vader, the villain, and there's a lot of great lore about him. And we realized, I think, or I realized very early on in this process that uh, a lot of that didn't necessarily belong in these pages because the Anakin Skywalker, you know, Anakin Skywalker is Darth Vader, but he sort of becomes this whole other thing for a, you know, a large part of the time that he's under that mask. And so the, the parts that we really wanted to explore in this story, I think, were the times that Vader was um, you know, really kind of swinging a little bit towards salvation or you know, maybe second guessing some of his decisions here. You know, when he's Vader, the red lightsaber swinging badass who's just you know, coming down the hall in Rogue One, you know, killing rebels, um, he's not that interesting to me from a biographical standpoint because he's made a decision and he's just going full throttle with it. But the Vader who is conflicted and who still kind of wants to save Padme and, you know, is really touched when he realizes that, uh, you know, his son is alive. He has a son, he's alive and he's, you know, standing in front of him, actually showing him a little compassion, which he arguably hasn't had since, uh, since Padme died, um, you know, is a really fascinating Vader that I wanted to explore a lot more. That's yeah, that's great. And I agree that that's, that's the more compelling. That's why he's Shakespearean to I me mean, when you've got the internal conflict and the, and the angst over decisions, but you're too far gone 
is is really really good. So let's talk about the newer films. Mm-hmm. Clearly, you wrote about Ray. The nice thing the Vader thing, actually, real quick. Sorry. Yeah, please. please. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, two other thoughts on Vader before we get away from him. But uh, there's two chapters in that section that I really love. And one is Unfinished Business, mm. which was, I think I love it because I think it turned out really well. But it was a bit of a bear <laughs> in the writing process because it was trying to really give equal weight to a journey that Luke and Leia and Vader were on at the, around the same time. So I kind of came to terms with it in terms of having to figure out a theme, which was, you know, that all the Skywalkers are on these kind of separate journeys at the same moment, trying to kind of figure out, uh, you know, what they're doing with their lives. And I, I think it came out really well in terms of exploring that era. And it's a section that takes place between films. So if you're a reader who's only seen the films and you haven't read any of the the books or comics or haven't read all the books and comics, some of that information is going to be new to you. Um, But the other chapter in that section that I really love is redemption. And it was really difficult and challenging when when I approached that chapter because that is such a pinnacle moment in cinema and in Return of the Jedi and for these characters. And so I knew we had to hit it just right. But I also knew we've all seen this moment. We all know what's going to happen here. So I was trying to explore it from different angles and really get into the heads of both of these characters and try and figure out how they were feeling in that moment. And I think one of the essential questions is, you know, is Darth Vader redeemable? And it's, the story tells us that he is redeemed, that his son helps him to be redeemed. He, he does um, you know, ultimately get redemption by killing Palpatine. But you know, the whole rest of the story leading up to that point had to support that in some way to make sure that you know, he was redeemable, that we were giving a really compassionate read, I think, to this character and to all of his demons. And one of the big themes that came out of the whole the book overall, I think, for me was that, you know, the light and the dark is not a decision that you make one day. You know, it's not Darth Vader swearing allegiance to Palpatine and then, you know, killing all the Jedi younglings. That's not enough of a, just a, okay, he's just a bad guy forever now. You know, the light and the dark are decisions that we make every single day. And you can always lean one way or the other. And that was kind of where I, I came down on the, the redemption question because, you know, the story's telling us, yes, Darth Vader was redeemed. But then I wanted to know well, how and why and how do we explain that? Um, so really just kind of trying to get in there and explore that end of things. The narrative is so important for that. Otherwise, that you don't care that he's redeemed, per se. I mean, you've got to have a narrative ripple You've got to have those those seeds that are planted throughout. And I love exactly how you orchestrated that because I think it, it makes it much more poignant, mm-hmm. if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay, I'm sure you've noticed, and people who have been listening to the show for years now, I'm purposely asking you things where we don't spoil. Yes, we know the story, but we don't know how you have told the story. So I hope someday we'll have you back on after people have gotten a chance to really dive into this thing because – Seriously, we could do a, a weekly Kristen show. I would love to hear your thoughts on all this stuff. So much fun. But let's talk about the newer films because I know a lot of people love those as well. And I'm certainly among them. But you wrote about Ray and Ben. Talk about the challenge of sharing their stories without giving hints or allusions to where they would eventually end up. The text, and I could be wrong, but is it, it's, is it historic present tense? It's hard to tell because you do so many cool things with the narrative that it goes well beyond point of view storytelling. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think the the present tense is something that I actually pulled from the the way we we do data bank entries on StarWars.com, which is to mm-hmm. kind of always treat the overview uh, as if it's potentially happening right mm-hmm. now. You know, we don't want to make anything feel like okay, this is already this has already happened. So, kind of to to keep it a little bit more lively and and feel a little bit more of the moment. Um, the diet was tricky because it's you know newer. I've had a lot less time to think about these characters um, than I have you know Luke and Leia and Anakin. Um, and there's 
a lot that we don't know definitively about how the dyad really works. So, you know, I wanted to really be careful there of, um, you know, making sure we were explaining it to the best of our ability, but not, um, not going too far in so much as trying to, to say things that, you know, we don't really have an answer to and also, you know, not going far enough. Um, and again, I feel like this goes back to my journalism training because when I first started out as a journalist, I felt like every time we did a story, I had to get every single answer to every single question. And then I quickly realized that sometimes it's okay to not have the answer. You just have to explain that. You know what? We don't know exactly how this works. It is shrouded in mystery. And so that was some of how we ended up approaching the dyad because it really is. And, you know, there is some lore. There is some lore in the Star Wars book right behind you. And, you know, we, we definitely pulled from that. But in terms of, you know, going too deep into exactly how the dyad works, um, you know, I think we kind of struck a balance between explaining it, but also not, you know, overly explaining it and, and not, uh, you know, not going too far off the deep end when it is something that is so new and is still so mysterious. Right. Um, but Ben is 10 years older than Ray. <laughs> and so in terms of like balancing the characters, um, I made sure that, you know, we kind of led with Ben cause he has 10 whole years of growing up with Han and Leia. Um, I will, it's not a spoiler, but one of the, the quotes we used was from uh, the aftermath trilogy which was uh han saying i i smuggle not snuggle and i was so <laughs> glad that that, yes. that made it um i put it in and i thought oh i hope we keep this uh because i just i i love that that quote that's just so han right there it is uh, yeah so in in this one we were really exploring a lot of what you don't see in the films if you've only watched the sequel trilogy and you haven't read any of the companion books you know you don't know what young Ben Solo was like, you don't know what he's been through or what he's experienced. So, you know, going back to, to Claudia Gray, who writes an amazing Leia and mm. taking all of the events in Bloodline and trying to digest those in a way that really helps to, to set the scene and set the context for, you know, what's going to come after it. Um, but another interesting challenging, uh, another interesting challenge with this was after Rise of Skywalker, knowing where Ray's journey ends, it felt wrong to start it off with. And, you know, she's no one from nowhere because we know better than that now. Mm. So being able to kind of fold that in from the very first chapter that deals with the dyad and set that scene, but not, you know, hint or spoil at their journey or what's really going to come after it. So just to, to give you that context, but not, you know, do too many winks and nods of, okay, sure. you know, we're going to tell you what's going to happen here. Um, Cause I do think one of the other challenges with a book like this is you don't know exactly who, who your reader is um, in terms of, you don't know what they know. So you have to write it in a way that if, if someone has just thinks, wow, that's a gorgeous cover by Matt Ferguson and picks it up and knows no star Wars uh, lore at all they will have enough, yes, that cover right there. Uh, they'll have enough information just within the context of the book to understand this story. So you give that, you give that person enough. Uh, and also I think we're writing with 12 and up in mind because Star Wars is for kids 12 and up. So we wanted the language to not speak down to them, but also to be, you know, again, kind of that newspaper style of simple enough that if you're 12 years old and you just think that's a cool cover, what's happening here? And you pick it up, you can understand the story. There's enough information there. And if you've seen every film, you definitely know where we're going <laughs> with some of these characters, but there's fresh insights and there's, uh, you know, information that really enriches that story, which is something I think, Dan, you and I probably talked about uh, when we were on the Star Wars show book club last mm -hmm. year. Mm -hmm. But the, every single time I read a Star Wars book, it changes how I see these characters that we know and love already from the films and from the series. It, it changes it in the best way possible, but you know, it gives me so much more to think about in terms of what they've been through, where they're going, what, what their journey really means, and why they do the things they do. So just having the chance to fold more of that into, 
into this story to to present that context was just wonderful. Um, and I think the insights are also really essential in terms of if you if the reader is neither of those two people I talked about, but is instead someone who has just read every single book and comic as it's come out, they've seen all the movies a million times, they can quote them word for word. Um, you know, I think this book, because it does present that context, also still gives them some fresh insights and some other things to to think about and debate. Absolutely, and that's and that was what I was going to say. I like that you you break it down for us, but you also allow for ambiguity. To me, Star Wars is at its best when there's a little bit of ambiguity there because it allows for your imagination, which George, of course, wanted from the get go, to really be captivated. Gosh, so so many great things to talk about this, uh, and your passion is so contagious. By the way. It thank truly, you. truly I feel like is. This whole podcast is just going to be you saying nice things and me saying thank you, and then you saying more nice things. <laughs> well, hey, get used to it. <laughs> get used to it. That's how we roll here at Can Coffee. You just call me every day and say nice things to me, though. I will. Great. I'll hey, post tweets. You. I'll yeah. Oh, <laughs> no, we can probably arrange. I could probably arrange for someone else to do it as well. <laughs> um, that'll be easy. All you have to do is pick up the book. Um, one thing I want to say uh, as we're wrapping up here. I love the fact that we've got two Skywalkers who both um, go from good to bad, but we've got so much more of Vader, of course, to pull from, but you don't make them sound the same at all. Now they're not the same, but that would be an easy kind of trap to fall into when you're writing and trying to figure out what you want to leave in, how you want to explain it. Cause there's only so many ways to say he's mean, he's bad, he's powerful, but yet they're you have angry. Yeah, exactly. But you're able to wear different hats and I really, appreciate how that came through. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and they are very different people. And I think that's another really important point that hopefully this book, because of the way it contextualizes those three generations of Skywalkers, it really showcases that, you know, back to something we were saying before about, you know, every, you're not just good or bad, you know, light side or dark, just mm -hmm. because one day you were like, I'm a Sith Lord now, boom. You know, it's, all this you know, pile of choices that you're making and, you know, kind of the, the scales mm -hmm. looking at your life at the end of it and seeing, okay, no, I, I did way more bad stuff than good stuff. So yeah, I guess I was over overall kind of a bad guy or wow, I did some really great deeds. Overall, I was a good person. I still had some missteps, you know, I still had some, some things that, you know, maybe I'm not super proud about, uh, you know, or regrets. And I think every single person in this family has both of that, both of those things, you know, they have the the good deeds and they have the not so great deeds and they have the things that they regret and they have the anger and they have the fear and some of them, you know, overcome it ultimately. And some of them, um, you know, really just end up feeding into it, but each person is an individual. And I think all of, you know, all of that goes back to, uh, even though originally the impulse was to create this modern mythology and these classic archetypes, mm -hmm. they really morphed into these very viscerally human, totally relatable, you know, I feel like I absolutely know them. And if I saw them on the street, I wouldn't be surprised that they're totally real, even though they're not in this galaxy kind of people. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I, I absolutely hear what you're saying. That it would be easy enough to lean into, uh, you know, Anakin was manipulated. Ben Solo was manipulated. You know, mm -hmm. uh, Snoke and Palpatine are, you know, doing their little Snoke and Palpatine thing. No one who can hear this now can see what my hands are doing, but they're puppeteering things. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm so used to doing video. I'm like, yes, you know, we'll do a hand gesture here. It's Everyone coming through. Things. I love it. Yeah. It's coming through. Yeah, but they are, are two very different people. And um, Anakin also, you know, I, I feel I feel a lot of compassion for, for both of them. Mm -hmm. But Anakin, you know, I think had a, a harder time because he was nine years old in a brand new city on a city planet, uh, thought he was going to be a Jedi, had that dream snatched away from him in the blink of an eye, got a brand new mentor to still be on that path, but it was totally different than I think it would have been if, if Qui-Gon Jinn had actually been his teacher. Right. And all of those things I think really made him ripe for the, the manipulation. But when I, you know, when I look at Ben Solo, he had, you know, he has his own 
uh, burdens and his own um, issues that <laughs> come from his family. But he certainly has so much more support, it would seem to me, mm-hmm. and a lot of love and compassion coming from you know his parents and his uncle. And you know his uncle, of all people, I think really understands what he's going through when he's a, a young man and he's dealing with that that darkness. Um, so to me, they're just you know very different journeys and very different people, and they also handle it very differently. Yes. They absolutely do. Yeah. And, they, and they're, they're very different people. And you're, and you're able to perfectly kind of show us that, which again, I, you know, I, I can't recommend this book enough. I, I love it. I just love it. I mean, I love even you hearing you talk about how daunting the first sentence is and, and, uh, and just the creation of sucking someone in who has read and enjoyed Star Wars in many different ways and forms and uh, TV, print, what have you. Skywalker of Family or what makes that, what makes this different? Because you've actually done something which I'm not sure if you're aware of or not, but think about this. People who have read this, whenever they go back and watch these films again or enjoy these characters again, they're going to look at them differently because of you, because of how you have painted this. That is such an amazing responsibility. I can't think of anyone better to do it. And I'm just so excited for you, if that makes sense. But so tell me about this book and the legacy it has and why it's different from other things that have come before it. First of all, I hadn't thought about that. Uh, <laughs> so I'm a, uh, I am a little overwhelmed by that. But, <laughs> it's uh, true. The, I, I'm glad I hadn't thought about that before. That reminds me of something Claudia Gray once told me actually in an interview that, uh, you know, she never really thinks too hard about all mm-hmm. of the people who are going to read this and all of the, uh, you know, huge Star Wars fans that are going to pick the, up her books because, you know, it might be kind of paralyzing if you really thought about it. Mm-hmm. So I'm glad I didn't think about that because I probably would still be on sentence one and my editor would be real mad right now. <laughs> uh, <laughs> two editors, two of my editors, <laughs> all of the editors would be super mad right now. I'd be getting a lot of phone calls. <laughs> um, yes. I'm sorry. I was so overwhelmed by that that I forgot the question. Oh, that's okay. That's fine. No, the question is basically this. Um, when people, because people say to me all the time, you know, what makes this book different? Mm. What, what, what can this offer for me that I haven't already read before? And the answer is a lot. All you have to do is listen to the show or open up the first chapter of the book. But what would you say to that? Mm, mm-hmm. I think the the big thing for me is a lot of books are that we've done in the past are either you know more standard retellings, where you know they really begin and end with the credits of the the film that they're retelling or the story that they're retelling. Or they are, you know, novels and stories in their own right that are exploring their own trajectory and these characters are a part of them, but it's its own encapsulated thing. And this, to my knowledge, is the first book that really folds in all this existing lore and provides that level of context for all these characters in one place. And I think if you read this book and you haven't read a lot, you know, all of the books and comics, it's going to give you a, just a little taste of some of them. And if you want even more information about that, um, you know, it can help direct your interests, I think, to some of the other uh, amazing books that are out there. Uh, I'm just going to keep fangirling over Claudia Gray over here, apparently. But one of the first Star Wars books I read for research for this was Master and Apprentice, because even though there's no Skywalkers in this book, it deals with two of the most important figures for young Anakin being um, Qui-Gon Jinn and Obi-Wan Kenobi. And so to just really get a better understanding of their relationship and who they are as individuals before they meet him, but also trying to answer the question of what happened that put Qui-Gon Jinn in the path of young Anakin Skywalker and made him the very perfect person to not only see his potential, but say, you know what, even though you're, you're kind of too old to train and the Jedi council doesn't really want me to teach you. I'm going to low key, just give you some insights and training over here. And eventually they'll come around. It's fine. Like how do you get to that point? And I think her book, you know, really explores that well. And so at the second chapter of my book, we get to fold in some of that lore to better provide that context. But I don't think you have any other existing Star Wars book that, you know, fills in all of those pockets of time. Mm -hmm. Although I will say time is a weird construct in space, (laughs) in a galaxy far, far away, Um, which uh, 
was another challenge that I dealt with in terms of in a regular biography, you would have meteorological, I cannot say that word, meteorological records. You would have weather. In a regular biography, <laughs> you would know what the weather was. Uh, you would know census data for the place that the person was born. You would be able to look at the newspaper from the day that they came into the world and say, this is what was in the news. This is what was happening. This is what the world was like. And we don't have any of that <laughs> for Star Wars or for the Skywalkers. So it was a really interesting challenge in terms of providing that context, but not nailing it down so specifically as you might with a you know, real world biography to be able to say on this date at this time, this person was born. Right. Um, and secondly, as Dan, I know, you know, uh, the, the timeline of Star Wars events, the years that Star Wars events take place are before the battle of Yavin and after the battle of Yavin. <laughs> and, um, I don't know what Brett's saying. I don't know what Brett's saying, but he's on mute and he is very emphatic about something right now. Sorry. Um, no, there, there's, there's a new naming convention because oh, that's yeah. what we do. So mm -hmm. anyway. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll have more stuff to learn. Yeah. I knew stuff. it's in, it's in the Star Wars book. <laughs> I need to read the Star Wars book more carefully. Apparently. Yeah. Duh. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but you know, because that was a bit of a challenge with this book, we really settled on keeping it so focused on the individuals and maintaining that um, context by just looking at what age they were. And you know, just, you keep saying like, okay, the year Anakin was 12, these events transpired and mm -hmm. you don't have a specific day to you know pin them to. But occasionally we were lucky. Uh, I know there's one chapter that really from the Revenge of the Sith era that really explores you know, one day being such a turning point in Anakin's life. You know, that was a rare case where we'll say, okay, you know, mm -hmm. we, can, we can see when he wakes up and we can see when he goes back to sleep here. So Here's how his day's going. And he's going to the opera. Isn't that nice? Oh, it's not nice. It's not great, actually. Let's take one more quick break and close out the show. This is Coffee with Kenobi. Listening to Coffee with Kenobi, you are with Dan Z, the podcast you're looking for. This is. <laughs> As we near the end of the show today, I want to thank each and every one of you for taking time out of your busy schedule to have a cup of coffee with me and for helping to spread the word about our Star Wars family we've got here at Coffee with Kenobi. Be sure to tune in Monday nights at 8 o'clock p.m. Central Standard Time on Facebook Live at www.coffeewithkenobi.com slash live or www.facebook.com slash coffeewithkenobi and have a cup of coffee tea, or any beverage of your choosing with me as we continue the conversation. To join us in the CWK Cafe, which is our Facebook group, and share your Star Wars thoughts, comments, reviews, and opinions in a family-friendly, spoiler-free place that is also drama-free, go to www.coffeewithkenobi.com slash community and be part of the conversation, talk about this week's show, or just talk about some Star Wars. We have a lot of fun and you'll make some new friends as well as catch up with longtime friends along the way. I also want to thank all of the new and longtime members of the CWK Alliance and let you know how much I appreciate your help and encouragement. If you want to join the CWK Alliance, go to www.cwkalliance.com and sign up today. Not only will you help out Coffee with Kenobi, you also get access to CWK Pour Over, the exclusive weekly podcast not heard anywhere else. It's a great way to support and help out the show, and 10% of your monthly contributions go directly to the St. Jude Children's Hospital to support the incredibly important work they are doing to help these brave children and their families. Plus, contributors at the CWK All-Star level can watch a video podcast of CWK Pour Over hosted by me, Tom Gross, and Corey Club. Feel free to reach out anytime if you have any questions. In addition to being part of the community on Facebook, please don't forget to visit our website at www.coffeewithkenobi.com for Star Wars news, announcements, reviews, videos, and so much more. If you have a question for me or just want to share your thoughts on the air, feel free to email me at danz at coffeewithkenobi.com and I'll share them on the show. You can also connect with me on Twitter at Mr. Zare 
M-R-Z-E-H-R, or on Instagram at DanZareCWK. There are also a lot more ways to connect with me and Coffee with Kenobi on social media. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram. Give us a like on Facebook at Facebook.com slash Coffee with Kenobi. Check us out on Pinterest or subscribe to our Coffee with Kenobi YouTube channel. On our YouTube channel, you can find Facebook Live video, different interviews throughout the years, highlights of video coverage throughout the Coffee with Kenobi history, and the audio podcast itself. You can order my book, The Star Wars Book, which I co-wrote with Lucasfilm's Pablo Hidalgo and Cole Horton on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Target, Books A Million, Walmart, or anywhere books are sold. You can also find my writing on Coffee with Kenobi's website, as well as StarWars.com, where I am an official blogger there, and on IGN, where I contribute occasionally to articles about Star Wars, as well as other popular culture topics. If you are considering starting a podcast or a blog, let me know how I can help you get started and make your creative vision a reality. Be sure to check out danzymedia.com and we can get the process started. I am also available to come to your school, conference, business, or organization to talk about how to tap into your strengths and help you bring out your very best. I want to inspire you to be inspired so you can take that first step into a larger world. Thanks, as always, to our Coffee with Kenobi sponsors, especially MEI and Mouse Fan Travel, our travel partner, and your one-stop shop for all things Walt Disney World, Disneyland, the Disney Cruise Lines, or anywhere on the planet you want to go on your vacation. Please go to www.coffeewithkenobi.com slash mousefantravel to book your magical vacation and help support Coffee with Kenobi in the process. If you like the show, please tweet out that you're listening, share it on Facebook, or invite your friends and family to tune in and share a cup of coffee with us. And if the force is especially with you, please take a couple of minutes to rate and review the show on iTunes or Google Podcasts. Every review makes a huge difference and helps to spread the word. And I can't thank you enough for your help, for your support, and your friendship. I love so much being a part of this wonderful Star Wars community, and I can't thank you enough for all that you do for me and Coffee with Kenobi. It's not the matter, it's the manner. It's the manner in your prose. It's the way you have written and executed this book uh, and made taking this universe and given it like a real world biographical lens to filter through that I thoroughly enjoyed. And you know, I mean that. So thank you so much for bringing this. I hope there's so much more to come from you. Obviously, we can see you on StarWars.com and all the great things you're doing. But if people want to reach out to you and ask you any questions about the book, where can they reach out on social media? Sure. I'm on Twitter and Instagram at Kristen Baver. Uh, you have to spell it right because I know there's a lot of Kristens with an E N and some Kristen Beavers that are probably getting name checked out there, but none of them are me. I love well, and of course, let everybody know where they can pick up Skywalker, A Family at War. Yes, Skywalker, A Family at War is now available on Amazon, bookshop.org, Target, and everywhere that books are sold. That's right. Well, what? Kristen, thank you again so much and continued success to you and all the wonderful things that you do. Thank you so much, Dan. Wow, so much fun talking with Kristen. Her enthusiasm is contagious, and you will certainly notice that when you're reading and experiencing this book, and it is an experience. Speaking of experiences, be sure to join me Monday night at 8 o'clock p.m. Central Standard Time on Facebook Live, where we discuss your top five favorite Ray moments. We did Kylo Ren last week. This week is Ray. We're going to look at these characters from the sequel trilogy and what you think are the top five moments worthy of discussion on Facebook Live. I can't wait to see everybody's ideas, thoughts, comments, and opinions. It's going to be a lot of fun, and it's only fun because all of you join me there on Facebook Live. That's www.coffeewithkenobi.com slash live. Until next time, everybody, have a great weekend, weekend, and remember, this is the podcast you're looking for. This podcast is not endorsed by the Walt Disney Company or Lucasfilm Limited. It is intended for entertainment and informational purposes only. The official Star Wars website can be found at www.starwars.com. Star Wars, all names, sounds, and any other Star Wars related items are registered trademarks and or copyrights of Disney and their respective trademark and copyright holders. All original content of this podcast is the intellectual property of Coffee with Kenobi unless otherwise indicated. This is the podcast you're looking for. There's no one here.